Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on experimental techniques. Okay, so uh, in this video what we're going to do is look at a way of preventing the expression of certain proteins uh, which involves short hairpin RNAs. Okay, now short hairpin RNA is also sometimes called small hairpin RNA. Okay, so they are exactly the same thing. Do not be fooled into thinking that they are uh, separate, different things. Short hairpin RNA is exactly the same as small hairpin RNA. Okay, now for short, uh, short hairpin RNA or small hairpin RNA is often abbreviated to SH for short hairpin and then RNA. So SHRNA is the shorthand for short hairpin RNA. Okay, right. So, the structure of this video then, we're going to start off uh, by uh, discussing the motivation, i.e. what we're trying to do is knock out uh, the expression of certain protein, okay? And then what we'll do is revise the central dogma of biology, because that's going to be quite essential for us to understand how these work. And finally, we'll then discuss how uh, they're actually going to work. Right. Okay, so, this is what we're trying to do then. We're going to start off with a totally normal cell here. So this is a normal cell. Okay, so let's give it a nucleus. So, what we want to do is knock out a protein. We want to stop this cell from producing a certain protein. Now let's call our target protein A. Okay, so we want this cell which is currently producing protein A to stop producing protein A, and short hairpin RNAs are going to be a way of knocking out the expression of this protein, and it's a way of doing it that isn't quite so brutal as a genetic knockout, because genetic knockouts uh, are, firstly, they take longer to do, and secondly, uh, they you know, you have to factor in all of the developmental uh, compensations and what you're looking at, the finished product might be very different from what you would see if you knocked out the protein with an shRNA, okay? So these are better in many ways than genetic knockouts, okay? They're more authentic. All you're doing is stopping uh, that protein from being expressed in a truly normal cell. Okay, right. Uh, so, Let's begin by revising the central dogma of biology then. So, in this nucleus we have DNA, okay? You have 46 chromosomes if we're dealing with a human cell. And let's say the gene for protein A is on chromosome 1. Now, of course, you have two chromosome 1s, and therefore you'll have two copies of this gene. Uh, so, let's now discuss what happens. So let's say we have some DNA here. So let's just revise the structure of DNA and it won't be necessary for us to know it particularly uh, rigorously. Okay, but DNA is a double-stranded molecule. You have two of these polymers of deoxyribonucleotides. Uh, okay, and basically the two strands firstly are complementary, so they'll have complementary sequences of organic bases. So there are four organic bases which are used in DNA, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, okay? So let's say that we just so happen to have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine as the sequence and of this piece of DNA. Now, the opposing strand, the opposite strand over here, will have a complementary sequence of organic bases to the sequence of organic bases on this first strand. And let's call this first strand, strand 1 here, and the second strand we'll call it strand 2. Okay, now the sequence of organic bases on this second strand will be complementary. Now, what's the complementary organic base to adenine? Well, that's thymine. Okay, the complementary organic base to thymine is therefore adenine. Okay, and the complementary organic base to cytosine is guanine, and therefore the complementary organic base to guanine is cytosine. Okay, so you have these two strands of DNA uh, that are complementary to one another and therefore bind together. Okay, now it's a little bit more complicated than that because the two strands are running alongside one another, but they're running in opposite directions basically. So, 
this side up here, let's call this the five prime end of this strand. So basically, DNA strands, if we look at a single strand of DNA now, rather than the double helix of DNA, um, basically, they are not, well, they have an orientation, they have a direction. Okay, so one side of the DNA strand, the single-stranded DNA strand, uh, will be called the five prime end, and the other will be called the three prime end. And this is just r with regards to uh, which direction the alcohol groups off the third and fifth carbons are pointing, basically. So the alcohol groups off the, th well, the fifth carbon is pointing in this direction of all of the deoxyribose sugars on this uh, sugar phosphate backbone of this strand here. And the three prime carbons alcohol groups are kind of pointing back down this way, basically. Okay, right. Uh, now, the orientation of this DNA strand here will be opposite to the orientation of this one. So its five prime end will be down here, and its three prime end will be up here. And that's what is meant by the two uh, DNA strands uh, running anti parallelly to one another. Okay, now. Um, this obviously is just a sequence of four organic bases. In reality, genes will be hundreds, if not thousands, of organic bases long. They're huge, great uh, sequences of organic bases. Now, um, let's say we now want to actually transcribe our genes. So we want to actually use the genetic uh, information in the gene uh, to make the protein. Okay, so let's temporarily just go down to a cheaper picture for a moment. So I'll just denote the DNA strand like this now. Okay, and let's say this portion here is now the gene. Okay, so what's going to happen is temporarily you will open up the DNA strands. So you'll break the two strands apart. Okay, like so. And you will then synthesize a complementary sequence of mRNA to one of these strands, not to both of them. You'll only actually use one of the DNA strands to make uh, the new piece of mRNA. Now, the DNA strand which you're going to use to make this piece of mRNA, which is this one in this picture, which was here before, is known as the coding strand. Okay, so this is now called the coding strand, because it's the one that is actually going to code for the mRNA. Okay, and the complementary strand that's attached to the coding strand, uh, that's the non-coding strand. So these two here, these are the non-coding strands. Okay, right. Another important point to say is that when you synthesize the mRNA, uh, it will be you know, its orientation will be the same as the complementary um, uh, DNA strand, okay? So if we look at this coding strand, if its orientation was 5' prime this way and 3' prime this end, then the orientation of this mRNA strand, which is this strand here, okay, which we've just synthesized, it will be uh, the same as the complementary DNA strand. So let me colour it in. So here's the mRNA in pink. So basically, its orientation will be 5 prime this end, okay, and 3 prime this end. Right, okay, and this mRNA will then go into uh, the cytoplasm after a few little modifications like splicing, okay, and then it will be translated by some ribosome into a protein. Okay, so that's all we need to know about the central dogma of biology. Right, okay, so let's now discuss how we are going to uh, knock out uh, the expression of this protein. Well, basically, the way you're going to do it is you're not going to block transcription. The genes for protein A will still be transcribed. You'll still produce mRNA. What you're going to do is you're going to target these mRNAs. You're going to knock these mRNAs. You're going to grab hold of them as they are trying to go from the nucleus to go and be translated, and you're going to destroy them, basically. So we're going to take out the mRNAs, and that's how we're going to stop the expression of this gene, because if we destroy all of the mRNA for this gene, uh, then you can't translate that mRNA anymore, and therefore you can't get any protein. So our, our tactics, if you like, to knock down the expression of this protein is to take out the mRNA. Okay, right. So let's now talk about 
how short, small, short slash small hairpin RNAs are going to work. So, let's say we start off with our cell that's perfectly normal and is expressing protein A. Basically, what you are going to do is you're going to start off with a plasmid, okay? Now, a plasmid is a circular piece of DNA, okay? So, let's say we have our plasmid. Oops, let me just show it as a circular piece of double-stranded DNA. It's not a single strand of DNA, it's a double-stranded piece of DNA. Okay, and basically, we are going to put into this plasmid the gene for our small hairpin RNA. Okay, so basically this is where short hairpin RNAs differ hugely from small interfering RNAs. When you use small interfering RNAs uh, to knock out gene expression, basically you do not insert in a plasmid. Basically you make the short small interfering RNA externally and then put it into the cell. In the case of short hairpin RNAs, you're going to get the cell to do all the work for you. So, uh, that's as my, that discussion there was just assuming that if you know something about small interfering RNAs. If you don't know anything about small interfering RNAs, don't worry. Okay, right. So, here is a gene for our small hairpin RNA, or short hairpin RNA. Okay, right. So, we will now call this plasmid our... Uh, expression vector for the short uh, hairpin RNA. So this is our uh, short hairpin RNA expression vector. And usually you use a short uh, a plasmid as the short uh, hairpin RNA expression vector. Okay, now, what you're going to now do is you're going to get your plasmid into this cell. Okay, so the plasmid will go into the cell. And what's now going to happen? Well, this plasmid, this double-stranded piece of DNA, is now in the nucleus of the cell, okay? And what's going to happen is you're going to make the mRNA for this gene, for the shRNA. So what you're going to do is you're going to break the plasmid's two strands apart temporarily, produce a piece of mRNA that's complementary to the gene, okay? And this is the start of our short hairpin RNA, so you've now produced this piece of mRNA, and this is going to be our short hairpin RNA. And I now need to explain to you uh, why this is called a short hairpin RNA. Okay, so basically, my claim is that what's going to happen is we are going to pick the uh, sequence of organic bases on this piece of RNA very, very cleverly, okay? So we're going to design this gene very, very cleverly so that there are two sections in here which are perfectly complementary. And I just want to um, put a little bit of notation here. So I'm going to call this the free prime end and this the five prime end. That's just so that we know which end is which. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two points here which are complementary to one another, okay? So what do I mean uh, when I say that? Well, let me show you an example. Okay, let me try and illustrate what I mean by giving you an example. So, I'm now going to draw out some sequences for these blue portions here, okay? So, let's say that this one is A, this one is, and remember there's no T, in RNA. This is uh, RNA, so there's uracil instead, so we'll put uracil there. Uh, C, G, and I'm going to keep this simple, so I'm only going to put four. Okay, so this represents my first blue region here. Okay, now I won't draw the um, organic bases of this intervening bit here, so I'll just leave that as a blank space. And then the second bit, I'm going to make this C, G, um, a is complementary to U, and U there. So basically, what have I done? Hopefully you might be able to see what I've done. Well, basically, I've made this first one complementary to the last one over here, and I've made this second one complementary to the second one from the last here, I've made this third one complementary to this third one from the last over here, and I've made this final one complementary to the first one over here. Now, why is that clever? Well, what's this going to do? 
And basically, C combined to G, G combined to C, A combined to U, and U combined to A. So basically, this entire thing can now fold over like this, and I just want to colour this in blue. Okay, so this is this second blue region over here. And remember, this was the free prime end, and this was the five prime end. Okay, so it's going to fold over like so. And, oh, I'm not going to be able to fit the organic bases in now. Damn. Okay, so I'll have to try my best. I'll colour code it. That's how I'll do it. That's how I'll get round having drawn a too small picture. So I'll colour code G red. I'll colour code C orange. I'll colour code U vivid purple. And I'll colour code A turquoise. Okay, so on this um, strand here, okay, and I should have spaced them out more as well. This picture's just not going right. Right, okay, so let me just separate these two off here. So this is the free prime end, and this is the five prime end. Okay, and I want this organic bases there. Right, okay, so on this strand, the first one that we have here is this A, so I'll colour this in turquoise. Then next we have uracil, U. Okay, so I'll colour this one in pink. Uh, next up we have cytosine here, the third one along. Okay, and then after that we have guanine, which is in red here. And then we have this intervening section all the way around here. And then on this side we have cytosine, which is in orange. Then we have guanine, which is in red. Okay, here. Then we have adenine, which is in turquoise. Okay, and then finally uracil, which is in vivid purple. Okay, so what's going to happen is um, because we have created these two strands, well, these two sections, which are basically complementary to each other in reverse, basically. So this is basically the complementary sequence to this, but in reverse, in reverse order, basically, because uh, the first one is complementary to the last one here, the second one is complementary to the second to last one over here, etc. And what can now happen is the whole thing can fold up like this and form this hairpin, okay, because it resembles a hairpin, basically. Okay, so this structure, once it folds up like this, is then known as the pre or pri sh rna and you'll see why i pronounce that pri rather than pre because later we will see something that has a better claim to be pronounced pre so we're also going to see something called pre sh rna this which i've shown you now is not pre sh rna yet so cross that one out it's pri sh rna Okay, and the reason it's called pri shRNA is that this is the primary transcript. Okay, so it's the thing that has just come off the gene, basically. Okay, so we put in this special uh, plasmid, okay, which is going to produce this piece of mRNA, which has this funny coding property that means that it can fold up like this. Now, later we will come back to specifying what this sequence should be, because at the moment, to construct one of these things, it doesn't have to be a specific sequence here. You can make up whatever sequence you like here. As long as you put the complementary one in reverse over here, uh, then this will happen. And later we'll come back to wanting to specify this, okay, so that Basically, this will be complementary to the mRNA of the original gene uh, coding for protein A that we want to block, basically. But we'll discuss that later. At the moment, let's just get to grips with the uh, hairprint structure. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video, we'll see how uh, this pri-shRNA is further processed.